Does it work? Good. Uh, so welcome to the um, 10th Belene Days Pico session. Uh, the way this is structured is that uh, um, the names will come up in alphabetical order. Uh, the presenter of the poster gets a maximum of two minutes um, uh, to add a, a few slides here. So that you have an idea when you're going to come up, I've put these in alphabetical order by first name. Uh, so you'll have a fair idea if you're next, however you won't know for certain. Um, we're going to just use this microphone. We're not going to use the headset because with the two minutes it will be rather elaborate changing every two minutes. So without any further ado, um, allow me to ask Aitor Adama Campino to come forward to present the first poster. Oh, okay. okay. Are you tired of using old and dusty methods to compute carbon transports in the ocean? Yes. Mm, I can imagine. <laughs> Have you struggled to analyze the role of different water masses in the carbon transport? Uh, you are in for a treat. I have a perfect solution for you. Stream functions. Yes, stream functions in carbon latitude space. Stream functions are a very simple tool and to simplify the way to look at carbon transport and the, in the yeah, carbon space. You can even compute carbon transport for free. Yes, but I don't see you very convinced yet. Yeah. Luckily for you, there is even more. You can compute the time scales it will take to compute these kind of cells and associate them to different water masses and processes. Yeah, so a special offer for all of you here this afternoon. If you come to the poster, you get a special treat on how to compute them. And so do not hesitate more and call now to poster number two. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was a hard act to follow. <laughs> Caroline Greiser, good luck. <laughs> Okay, hi, I'm Caroline Greiser from Plant Ecology. Uh, this is a northern cold adapted species from the Swedish forest. And um, the climate gets warmer and it gets too warm for that species. So now it can either move to colder climates in the north, up the mountains, or maybe just around the corner. And that's what I'm basically doing. I'm studying microclimate in the Swedish forest and how it affects plant species distributions, especially at their range margins. And with that poster that I'm presenting, I answer the questions, where is it cold in the landscape? When is it cold there? And why is it cold there? And I would also like to, maybe you can click. Yes, exactly. Uh, also like to link my poster to two other posters from Ditte and Ellen which used microclimate maps that we produced in that study. So we, yeah, we created high resolution climate map maps over central Sweden that are uploaded at the Bolin database and free to use. Thank you very much. And next up, Dieter Christiansen. Hello everyone. I'm Dieter. Uh, I come from Department of Ecology, Environment and Plant Sciences here at Stockholm University. And what I would like to share with you today is one of my PhD projects that's about responses of plants to land use facilitated microclimate change. Um, as, uh, as we act maybe saw, or no we didn't see it on Caroline's uh, slide, we have this transition zone in Sweden between two biogeographical regions. And here we, we, uh, we see that a lot of plant species either have their northern or southern range limits. And at this zone, we then see, uh, tend to see northern plants live at colder microclimates. Um, and at, as you will see on Caroline's uh, poster, vegetation density and structure is a major contrib contributor to microclimates, colder microclimates. Uh, oh, what I would like to say is that colder microclimates are coupled to dense forests. Um, but the majority of forests in Sweden are managed. So uh, what I ask in this project is what happens to these uh, species populations and the composition in colder microclimates 
when we thin the forests and we see a temperature uh, increase. Um, the same you could ask, or the reverse you could ask for southern plants that tend to grow in warmer microclimates uh, with forests that have more sparse vegetation. So uh, in that case, what happens when the forest grow denser and we see a temperature decrease? Uh, so these questions I try to answer in my project. Uh, and you can read more about my approach uh, at my poster and come and have a talk with me uh, about whether forest management activities or the outcome of these activities actually act as climate change. And that was exactly two minutes. Well done. Emily Graham. Emily. Okay. Um, hi, so I'm Emily, and I'm a PhD student at Luftlab here at ACES. And uh, today I will present a poster that talks about the increased volatility in cloud residuals compared to ambient aerosols. And, uh, this was measured during the cloud and aerosol experiment at Åre uh, during the summer of 2014, located at the mountaintop in central Scandinavia. And this is a very nice place to study aerosols because this is an intersection between many different types of air masses. So we can study polluted air coming from the continent, but also like marine air, boreal air, and even pristine Arctic air. And um, so as the title of the project suggests we wanted to study cloud and aerosol interactions and uh, during my project I have been looking at volatility and hygroscopicity and how these properties affect uh, cloud droplet activation and even what happens to these properties once the cloud is formed. And so I already gave you the answer in the title. We have an increased volatility once the cloud is formed but now the question comes this is kind of a uh, like um, a question like the chicken and the egg. Is it so that the volatility affect the cloud droplet activation? Or is the volatility changed once the cloud droplet is formed? And I have poster 13. Thank you. Frederick Schenk. Oh, hey, um, my poster is basically about old stuff and new stuff. Um, the old stuff is that we found in a very high resolution model that 12,000 years ago in summer, uh, the flow over the ice sheet here, the Phoenix Canyon ice sheet, typically cannot go over it. And then you get this atmospheric blocking which leads to warm summers. And now the question is actually which kind of criteria define when you have that transition that you have overflow and when do you get uh, basically blocking and there we start to do a comparison with KDH. And the question is if that is only a typically fluid dynamical problem around the object or do you also need all the thermodynamics that the ice is important to cool the air, you get density differences and just welcome at my poster to discuss it. Thanks. Gabriel Quadra. I just lost my thing, sorry. <laughs> so, good afternoon. My name is Gabriel and I will present my poster, Sediment Carbon Burial and Methane Saturation in an Amazon Hydroelectric Reservoir. So, we are experiencing a global boom in hydropower dams worldwide, especially in the tropics that is possible to see in this figure. And Amazonian reservoirs are expected to be an important source of carbon to the atmosphere, but also Amazonian has reservoirs can be a carbon sink for, for, for to the, from the atmosphere. But we do not know about it. It's just a speculation because we do not have a measure about carbon burial in a hydroelectric reservoir in Amazon. So we choose a hydroelectric reservoir in Amazon, in Brazil, Curuauna Reservoir, to estimate carbon burial and also uh, methane production. 
and we found a high carbon boreal in the, the reservoir in this first figure, above the average in the other hydroelectric reservoirs, but also we found a methane saturation in the sediment, which means that Kuruauna Reservoir is an important carbon sink, but also maybe an important source of methane from, to the atmosphere. So thank you and come to see me if you have further questions. Thank you very much, and it's Ineas uh, Bulatovic. Hi, my name is Ines Bulatovic, and I come from the Department of Meteorology. Uh, the study that I will present uh, basically is dealing with aerosol indirect effects in marine stratocumulus, but let's start from the beginning. Uh, and schematic figure of stratocumulus clouds, we can see um, that um, there are many processes that connect these clouds with, um, with uh, surface in different ways, and these clouds are very important for analyzing because they are critical for the Earth's uh, energy budget. They reflect a lot of sunlight, uh, but they don't affect long wave radiation because they have similar temperature as underlying surface. The other thing that is important are aerosol particles that can affect the reflexivity of the clouds and they can also um, uh, change the cloud water uh, in, in clouds and they and they are and their uh, lifetime. And the interesting thing is that climate models and more detailed uh, models as large added simulations uh, show uh, different cloud response uh, to increasing aerosol concentrations. So our question in, in our study is uh, can different parameterizations for cloud droplet activation actually change this simulated cloud water response? And the answer is yes. The simulated aerosol indirect effect is almost three times as large when uh, cloud droplet concentration is prescribed and not uh, prognostic. And if you want to hear more about that, what is the story uh, behind these results, come to my poster. <laughs> Thank you. Yannick uh, Martin. Hello everyone, um, my name is Yannick and together with my colleagues at ACES we are working on a Circumarctic Shelf Sediment Carbon Database, in short Cascade, uh, which is aimed to better understand the environmental change that's happening in the Arctic due to climate change. Um, when we look at the, the northern permafrost region we see that uh, permafrost is prone to rising temperatures of course, so we see increasing active layer depth which makes carbon available. That's then remobilized to Arctic river systems, finally ending up in the Arctic Ocean. But environmental change in the Arctic is also associated with uh, coastal erosion of permafrost coastlines. Um, and what you can see in the sketch there is that both types of terrestrial carbon enter the Arctic Ocean, then mix with primary produced organic matter, and then ultimately settles on the sediments. And we can use those sediments as integrated information carriers for understanding what's happening on land. And this is what this Cascade project is about to do. Um, we are building up this Cascade, which holds a couple of thousand data points already with uh, information on carbon isotopes and biomarkers. And uh, we are at this phase looking at mostly surface sediments. Later on, we will also go to into the, the geological history, look at deeper sediments, trying to understand what happened at past warming and climate change events. And uh, yeah, if you're intrigued by where the hotspots of organic matter remobilization to the Arctic Oceans are, come by my poster. See you later. Carolina Siegel. What happened to the title? <laughs> um, oh, OK. Uh, yes, hi, I'm a PhD student at the Department of Meteorology, or MISU. And um, my poster has the name, linking marine microbiology to cloud formation in the high Arctic summer. And uh, it's about MISO's contribution to the MOCA campaign that we uh, did. It was an eight-week campaign at the North Pole this summer from August to September. And um, yes, the project is about how microorganisms in the ocean 
emit um, aerosols to the atmosphere, and uh, how these form clouds, how these clouds then um, uh, influences the climate, and how the climate then influences the microbiology again. Um, so I present the samples we took, and we don't have any results yet, so it would be really nice if you wanted to come by and uh, give me some input what we can do. It's number 29. <laughs> Thank you very much, Carolina. And just to be absolutely clear, the error in the slide is my doing, not Carolina's, when it comes to ranking posters. So you can rank mine down. Um, so Leon Sun? Leon. Oh, there you are, right in the middle. Let Leon out. Go, Leon. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm uh, a visiting PhD student. Uh, it's difficult to detect the influence of reservoir on climate in engaged uh, area. Uh, here, our team developed the tree ring method to detect it. Um, uh, we did uh, the field, uh, field sampling in eight different uh, sites uh, surrounding the reservoir. And after measuring, um, measuring the tree, uh, Weeds of each tree ring and uh, uh, extracting the uh, climate, climatic uh, uh, signals uh, of the uh, of the tree rings, we got the uh, tree ring weeds chronologies. Uh, because the uh, statistical methods uh, cannot detect the change of the influence, uh, we uh, uh, develop the uh, multi-window running correlation analysis and uh, the region shift, uh, shift detections. Um, then we can uh, detect the uh, influence uh, about the shift time and the shift direction. Uh, the shift, shift time is, uh, was consistent with the time when the, time, when the reservoir uh, was impounded. And uh, the shift direction shows that the uh, discrepancy, discrepancy be between reservoir and non-reservoir areas enlarged. Uh, at last, uh, we used uh, the uh, tree rim uh, in another reservoir as our special validation and uh, uh, remote sensing data as uh, temporal validation. Uh, both va uh, both uh, validated our uh, uh, funding of the tree rims. Uh, that's all. Thank you. Please come to my poster. Thank you very much. Loka von Schmalensee is, a, I guess. Yeah, yeah that's good. <laughs> Uh, okay, I'm going to try and just... Hi, uh, my name is Loke. I'm a PhD student at the Department of Zoology, and the title of my poster is Investigating the Effects of Microclimate Variation on Insect Overwintering. Uh, so insects overwinter in a sort of a deep resting state, especially in temperate areas most often. Uh, and these insects spend the majority of their kind of pretty long life uh, under conditions that would otherwise be kind of harsh. Um, so, uh, insects are ectothermic, which means they are heavily affected by external temperatures. And, uh, yeah, they are also important in many aspects. They can be pests, they can uh, be food for other animals, they can spread diseases, they pollinate, etc. So what we want to do is to uh, see uh, how insects, uh, or more specifically this species of butterfly, the green and white, is affected by climate variation, and that is microclimate variation. So you heard about it. It's climate variation on a small spatial scale. Uh, so we have uh, sampled in this area called Kronengen, which is roughly a quarter of a square kilometer. And we have lots of temperature loggers, uh, 120 of them. And so we measure temperature, and we get a really high resolution. And so we can try to relate this potential variation in microclimate to different things in this species. So we transplant out animals over the winter, uh, yeah, uh, and uh, we can measure stuff. Uh, we do other experiments. If you want to hear more, uh, so how we try to link microclimate variation to the ecology of this particular animal, please come by my poster. Uh, thanks. Thank you, and Matt Sitonen. 
Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Matsutan. I'm a new PhD student at the Department of uh, Zoology at Stockholm University. And uh, I don't have any data yet, so I'm going to just show you what I'm going to do and my PhD. Uh, on the map, you see the distribution of, of this butterfly, the wall brown, and the uh, red area is the most recent distribution. So we see that it seems to have uh, expanded quite a lot northwards in Sweden and Norway. And uh, when a species expands northway, northwards, it's expected to, um, or it uh, has to adapt to new conditions. Even if it uh, shifts only because of climate change, there will be uh, aspects of the environment that won't change with the climate. So day length is an important aspect for insects because they time their diapause, which is a resting stage for winter, uh, according to day lengths. So I will study how these potentially adapt to new conditions in the northern range margin. Thank you very much. And uh, Sebastian Palomino uh, Angel. Thank you very much. I am Sebastian Palomino. And the name of my poster is Analysis of Surface Water Flow in a Tropical Fluid Plane Using INSAR Techniques. So uh, what, uh, what, what we do and uh, where? Uh, well, we analyze how is surface water flow over a uh, fluid plane in South America, in northern South America. It's called Atrato River Basin. And how is the surface water flow related with uh, with water level changes in the fluid plane. Why did we do this? Uh, surface water flow condition and control different natural and human processes over fluid planes. And uh, this surface flows has um, very complex uh, patterns in spatial and temporal analysis. So that are difficult to monitor using a specific field stations data. So satellite data could provide interesting uh, and valuable information to, to follow these patterns in a large scale. How did we do this? Um, we use interferometric scientific aperture radar information, and we derive uh, from that interferograms for the, for the entire basin. And from that, those interferograms, we uh, analyze the phase change patterns and how uh, is the spatial distribution of these patterns, how is the temporal uh, fluctuation of the patterns, and how the patterns are related with uh, level changes in the river. Uh, what did we find? Uh, we generate a, a phase change maps from the entire basin, and uh, we found large scale um, surface water flow uh, patterns in the area, and how this uh, varies from different parts of the basin. And also we find a very high uh, relationship between the phase change and the, and the water level in the river changes. Thank you very much. And that was also exactly two minutes. Well done. Semyon Shimanke. Yeah. Hi, I'm Simon Chimanka from SMHI, and I'm the service manager for the Copernicus Regional Reanalysis for Europe. Um, so you should be interested in my poster if you need uh, weather data, historical weather data um, in, in Europe. Um, so, for example, if you're using in the moment uh, the global reanalysis, uh, era interim, or probably already era five, but you think, okay, but I need something with higher resolution, uh, better quality in Europe, um, then you're welcome to come to my poster and check actually the regional reanalysis for Europe. Um, so, what we offer is actually hourly data um, from 1961, uh, close to real time. So, this is an operational service where we update the database at least once a month. Um, we have data at 11 kilometer re resolution uh, with a 3D model and then actually at 5.5 kilometer as only a few surface analysis. Um, we offer a lot of uh, parameters as typical for reanalysis data and part of the service is of course also user guidance and, and service. So Copernicus is, is there to help you or we. 
Oops, one one more slide. So this uh, shows you um, the uh, the area. So we cover really entire Europe. So if your study area uh, lies inside uh, this model domain and you need weather data between 61 and now, um, you're welcome to contact us. And yeah, we have 31 parameters at the surface and a lot of uh, parameters also for the upper atmosphere. So if you're interested, please come to my poster. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks to all our presenters. Uh, we're now going to move on to the poster session. Um, and uh, the way that works is there's a bar out there. Uh, our representation rules have changed. That means you have to actually buy your own beer. But the good news is, is that you're supporting uh, one of Sweden's oldest societies, the Geology Club. So uh, that's quite good. So go and spend loads of money and, re and make sure you pick up a slip and rank the posters. That is your task. We will have a ban on drinking to people who don't actually rank the posters. So welcome to the poster session immediately outside. Thank you very much. Thank you.